Hi, everyone. This is the Chutababa from Nightlight Astrology. It is Friday, March 13th. And today, my wife is with me to talk about the intersection between planets and plants. I'm really excited to um, have my wife here. I'm going to introduce her in just a second. But um, first of all, let me just say that um, this is a very ancient relationship between planets and plants, something that I've been, as you probably know, if you listen to my channel, I've been talking about the intersection between planets and plants for a long time and promising more content that my wife and I were developing around this. Most people don't know that when I met my wife um, back in 2010, um, I met her because I was teaching astrology at a conference that she was, or a, a retreat that she was leading where she was teaching herbalism. And uh, so herbal medicine and, and astrology were literally how we came together and met. And so we're really excited to bring forth a bunch of new content um, in the months ahead uh, about um, planets and, and plant medicine. So um, yeah, without uh, saying too much more, um, uh, this is my wife, Ashley. I hope you, I'm glad for, you get to meet everyone. Hi, everyone. <laughs> cool. So I guess what we're doing today is we thought, you know, everyone's pretty freaked out about the coronavirus right now. And it's actually a really good time to be um, working with certain kinds of plant medicines to take care of ourselves, to boost the immune system, to reduce the level of fear and panic. Um, and the planets can help us know which particular plants that we need to work with and which, um, you know, which particular plants are going to be the best allies around a moment like this. So that's what we're going to talk about today. My wife is the expert with when it comes to plant medicines. What I'm going to try to do is talk a little bit about the signatures of the planets right now. And, um, and Ashley's going to talk about um, the uh, pot pot different potential uh, matchings of those signatures with different kinds of plant helpers. Does that, does that sound right? Did I say that right? Yeah, that sounds, that sounds perfect. Okay, cool. So um, at any rate, actually, you should also know when we first started, um, we, we started dating and seeing each other for a couple of years, we, we were teaching a lot of classes together on the intersection between astrology and herbalism. And then since we've had kids and we had a yoga studio that kind of got really busy, um, we had kind of drifted away from teaching classes together about, about astrology and herbal medicine. So we're also just really, it's just like, I'm just realizing in this moment, like, wow, it's been a really long time since we've actually taught together, hasn't it? It has been. Yeah. And we used to do, um, remember the planet and plant consultations where we would sit down with clients and, you know, that was something that we started off doing as well. So it is nice to come back together and, uh, you know, under unfortunate circumstances. However, um, yeah, it, it, I think it is timely to talk about how these two ancient sciences and arts blend together and, and hopefully give people some reassurance by the time they finish listening to this talk. Yeah. Um, who was it? You probably remember better than I do who it was in the ancient world that said you can't become uh, a doctor unless you're first an astrologer. Do you remember who that was? That was Hippocrates. Yeah. So his father was an astrologer and a midwife. And um, he was quoted saying that he who doesn't study astrology but practices medicine is but a fool. <laughs> um, yeah. So I always tell my students that just, you know, to say that their, you know, ancient herbal medicine was practiced with a deep reverence and a deep um, need for astrology. And, and so, yeah, it's, it, it, there's a long intersection between these two. Cool. Hey, can you turn off the volume on the back of your mic just a tiny bit so we can pick up your voice just a little bit louder? It's quiet for me. I, I hope it's good for everyone else. But at any rate, um, yeah, that's, I mean, isn't it funny that today really you're, you're looked at as just a total fool if you put your trust in either herbal medicine or astrology. And actually, I think hopefully what we'll find today is that some of the most basic things that you can do all over the world, regardless of where you live, have to do with tapping into what the local plant, the, the sort of indigenous plant medicine has to say and using that to create an environment that's less conducive to the invasion of a, of a, of a bacteria or a virus in this case. I mean, yeah, totally. Um, okay. So one of the things that strikes, you know, it's just very obvious in the sky right now is the predominance of planets in the sign of Capricorn. So I'm going to put this up on the screen so that everybody can see it for starters. Um, let me just share my screen. So, you know, when we're looking at um, trying to understand the energetic signature of um, something that's happening and that might be difficult and how do we treat it with plant medicine. One of the baseline things that we need to look at is which planet is signifying the illness. This is standard practice 
uh, you know, in medieval horary astrology, medieval medical astrology, dating all the way back to, you know, our uh, Indian and classical Western Hellenistic roots, you have to figure out which planet is signifying the illness or which group of planets or which planetary configuration. In this case, though, there's a lot of things going on in the sky right now. And we're just going to focus on the traditional seven for today. And what I want to highlight is, or just sort of emphasize here, is the predominance of planets in Capricorn. Um, if you saw the horary um, lesson that I did yesterday on the coronavirus, you probably remember that the illness was signified by Jupiter. And um, Jupiter is in Capricorn right now. Um, so I have actually have something from a 17th century astrologer on some of the particular significations of um, the late degrees of Capricorn that might be interesting. I'll bring that in a little bit. We're going to riff off from that together. But for starters, we have the south node of the moon, which is of the nature of Saturn in Saturn's sign of Capricorn. We have Mars exalted in the sign of Capricorn, which is Saturn's sign. We have Jupiter in its fall in Capricorn, Saturn's sign. And we have Saturn in Saturn's sign. So that is a powerful lineup of planets in Capricorn. Now, from like Aristotle-ish onward, we know that the um, qualities that were associated with the signs and planets were of great importance when coming to diagnose something medically. I'm not a great medical astrologer, but there's some simple things that we can do. Um, for example, Capricorn is, um, you know, uh, an earth sign and earth is going to be cold and dry. So the predominance of you know, cold energy and dry energy stands out with a bunch of planets sitting in Capricorn. Um, let's just start there, actually, because what we're going to do is we're going to build off from this a little bit. But this is the stellium that indicates what's going on right now with Pluto in the mix there as well, which I don't have pictured right now. The baseline condition that we're dealing with is an abundance of, you could say, cold, dry energy. And then in terms of the, the you know, the... Um, the humors, we're talking about melan the melancholic temperament or the melancholic quality. So maybe you could just say something about that and about how what we're seeing right now in the world, maybe with the coronavirus in particular, expresses some of these melancholic or cold and dry qualities. Sure, yeah. I mean, I think one thing that's very Saturnine that we're all experiencing is the the quarantine and the containment, the confinement that's that's very much associated with Saturn. Um, but, you know, one thing that's really interesting is one of my herbal teachers, Matthew Wood, he is in, in a lot of his um, most recent blogs about the coronavirus and about um, energetics and how do we deal with this, is that one of the greatest risks we have to contracting this is coldness and dryness. And so even the CDC is saying, you know, make sure that you keep your mucosal membranes uh, moist, which means, um, you know, you can use a number of different substances, even something as simple as olive oil up in the sinus, sinus cavity to keep the mucosa nice and moist because the virus um, likes to grow where it's cold and dry. And so that's kind of the first thing we see is that, you know, if we're kind of all holed up, <laughs> you know, we're in, you know, a, a, an environment where there's, um, you know, radiant heat, which it's, you know, cold in most places in the country still here in early March, uh, you know, you're, you're going to be more prone to being dried out. And that is something that is going to put you at greater risk. So staying hydrated, keeping your sinus cavities nice and moist is something that is really important. The other thing that Matthew Wood speaks to is the, uh, the great need for diaphoretics right now. And so in classic herbalism and medical terminology, diaphoretic is something that opens up the pores. That means it, it opens the periphery and it allows the body to sweat and move heat and you could say toxins and metabolic wastes out of the body. And so if we have a lot of this constricted more uh, Capricornian energy, then we're, you know, that is going to, if we don't have open pores, that hardness is actually going to also make us more susceptible. So in traditional Chinese medicine and in more of the Western herbal tradition, uh, the call to people as part of a preventative tactic is to warm your body, warm the interior and open the exterior so that we can actually allow any pathogen, number one, to not have a cold environment, which they like to thrive in, but also that uh, we have constant cycling and movement. You know, Capricorn, I think of, you know, the, the goat on the rock. <laughs> um, so we're, you know, we're, we don't have a very hard, um, 
you know, physical structure that this thing can take off in, but rather that we're porous and open. And there's a number of great herbs that will work with that energy and allow you to have that diaphoresis and that sweating action. Well, let's talk about those in just a second. I want to I want to jump in and say one thing that I think is really remarkable, which is that. So which which planet is most likely sort of the the one that introduces the virus? A lot of people are saying, oh, Saturn, Pluto. Not really. Um, Saturn and Pluto together don't really signify the virus as much as Jupiter signifies the virus right now. Saturn and Pluto can set the stage and can um, have something to do with the triggering events that lead to the proliferation of the virus. For example, we have Saturn and Pluto conjoining right before the virus starts you know, spreading. Um, and it, you know, we don't know exactly where the virus came from. I believe, you know, the, the, there's, of course, there's tons of different theories about it out there. So I don't want to ignite that fire, but there's also, you know, just basically maybe some very deep and sort of unconscious karmic issues that we can't necessarily see that detonate or release this energy, this Plutonian energy that wants to challenge some of the, the, structures, behaviors, attitudes, dispositions of the world um, at, at a deep level. And then we may not be aware of that right away. And we, the, the, the way in which the societal structures are challenged may not, we may not be aware of the, the, the transformative power of that Saturn-Pluto moment for quite a while. But what signifies that rapid growth of a virus? That's more Jupiterian and specifically because Jupiter is the planet of growth and proliferation. If you think in the ancient world, Jupiter is associated with the conditions that a plant or, you know, like even like you think of a rainforest that are, are necessary for a lot of life to grow and, and proliferate. Or like, you know, if you think of fungus and the wide, huge spread of a fungus network, or if you think about um, plants in a hot, wet, moist environment, Jupiter is a planet that's associated with heat and, and, and moisture and sort of proliferation and growth. But of course, the reason that Jupiter, one of the reasons that Jupiter is in its fall traditionally, uh, which is a difficult place for Jupiter in the sign of Capricorn is because here you have a planet that's just mis mismatched in a cold, dry environment. And so you have something that wants to grow, but there's this restrictiveness, or you could look at it another way and say that you have this really um, kind of detrimental mix of something that wants to grow and proliferate, but it's doing so in an environment that is cold and, and dry. And it sounds like from what I was hearing you say, um, and what we've, you know, we've been discussing on the couch at night is that that is almost precisely the description of what the virus is, is like, or what it's doing, or how it's behaving. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's the, yeah, the Jupiterian description of this sort of warm You know, it's really interesting if we think about germ theory versus terrain theory, and this is something that a lot of immunologists, um, you know, they are, they they discuss and and um, it, you know is a hot topic in the herbal world, which is you know there's the germ theory which focuses on what is the germ, you know, what is this coronavirus look like? How does it behave in a petri dish? How does it behave in human tissues? But terrain theory looks at well, what is the environment in the body, and is the is the environment in the body what is it conducive to? Kind of like your rainforest analogy. You know, the rainforest is conducive to certain types of plants, whereas, you know, the desert is conducive to other types of plants. So what we're seeing right now in some ways is a, is, is a, is a virus that has taken advantage of, I would say, a, a, an immune compromised society um, that is overworked, overstressed, not really nourished, probably not like focusing on all the right things all the time or at least enough to really you know rebuild the 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 interior spaces and so uh you know we could look at this as a as an example of something that is yeah that is showing us and giving us an opportunity to say okay well what what environment have we created as a society and, and what might this coronavirus actually have to, to teach us and to help us sort of reshift and, and refocus. So, you know, in my herbal practice more specifically, you know, I'm really working with my students and my clients to focus on their own internal environment. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's things we can do, yes, in the outside, but really, you know, as, you know, 
the more we move towards quarantine, the more important it is that we really do take that internal inventory and look at what is our internal environment like. And Michael Tierra, who runs um, a, a traditional Chinese medicine and Western herbal school out in California, he has a really great article that's posted now. And he, ha he basically says, check in and see if your own internal environment is more damp and or, or sorry, is more cold or more hot. And the very first thing you can do to regulate and make yourself less vulnerable to this disease is to balance that. And so he's also going back to start with the internal environment and, and notice where you might be out of balance. So, and as you're saying that, one of the things I'm thinking about is that there's, it's in a weird way, the, the attitude of quarantine, even though in, on one level, there's something very smart about sort of, um, you know, maybe stepping out of large group situations, or I mean, in some ways, kind of taking um, a, a quarantine approach, maybe quarantine isn't the right word, but kind of a defensive approach and kind of um, making sure that we're not out in big, huge packs of people or whatever is smart. On the other hand, it's not identical to a, 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 a culture of quarantine that's rooted in fear and panic and so forth, which in some ways, as a Saturnine response, uh, a cold, dry, restrictive response is actually conducive to some of the signatures of the virus. Is, do, I, do I hear that right? Yeah. I, I mean, I think what a f the, the Saturnine qualities that a lot of people are, are possessing as a response to this is fear and panic, and that depletes and lowers our immunity. So that isolation that you know the buying all the toilet paper and all the things that people are doing out of fear and really um yeah isolating themselves you know in, in many ways that that is going to create a host of different chemical reactions in the body which does make you more vulnerable and i just had the image when you were talking like how nice would it be instead of everyone quarantining off into their houses and you know watching the map expand the red zones if we were out in the gardens or if we all were out in a park and we were like okay hey everyone let's go pick some plants that we can all uh, make a tea out of to boost our immunity or hey what do you have in your yard oh i've got this in my yard and you know hey what resources do you have what, what do you cook oh i cook this like that would be a very different you can even just feel it in your body thinking about that as a response how that's just a very very different internal uh yeah, that's a, that creates a very different internal space than what we're what we're currently seeming to do. Yeah, it's almost as though the the you know the 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 fear, like I said, the fear based response is sort of conducive to the dry, cold um, qualities that um, the virus will thrive in, and so we have to be really careful that even if we're taking some necessary precautions like not going to massive stadiums with thousands of people or not going to large events with even hundreds of people they're saying now, or for a while they're closing schools or what have you um, to prevent the communal sort of spread um, that we also, as I heard you saying, we also want to make sure that there, there's this almost like the, the natural qualities of Jupiter which are the are associated, for example, with the ability to release, having the pores open, um, the you know kind of heat and um, I don't remember exactly what you said, but it was you know kind of keeping the pores open. You were talking about the nose and just that kind of openness. That it's important that that be that be a part of the internal environment, and that there's also um, it's I think that there's this you know. We're being something that's being exposed right now is our sort of obsession with, um, with with like um, privacy. You know, it's like it's like the, the appropriate response may not be to wall off from your neighbors or from smaller groups of people who can kind of coexist to, together a little bit more. Um, and so maybe you could talk just a little bit more about what you think the energetic signature is that uh, around around Jupiter here to kind of redeem or or sort of bring out the positive Jupiter in the moment and herbs that can do that too. You're talking about herbs that can help us sort of stay open in the skin and the body and things like that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really good point that, yeah, that we, we definitely can um, use this as an opportunity to, to open ourselves a little bit more and, you know, to be more trusting of this whole process. And uh, yeah, I mean, Jupiter, I also think of Jupiter and, 
correct me if this is if this is not exact, but Jupiter is sort of the light bringer. Like Jupiter is sort of a harbinger of 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 light and um, sort of uh, sort of diffusive light. The great and benefic, yeah. The great benefic, yeah. So so you know, in thinking about Jupiter like that. Um, whatever we can do to mirror that in our bodies and in our psyche, I think would be a, would be a really healthy thing for ourselves and then to mirror that to others. And I've been telling my students that, you know, right now in social media, really what would be most supportive is empowering posts and funny ones, things like, you know, there's a bunch of funny memes going around, but just keeping things a little light, keeping things a little bit open, um, being honest about how you're feeling, sharing, you know, reaching out to people. That's all that, you know, that, that diffusive energy. And then herbally um, are the diaphoretics. That's kind of what they're classically called. But, you know, these are any sort of herb that uh, stimulates sweating and the sweat response. So my number one favorite is elderflowers, not elderberry. So they, they are two different medicines. Um, but elderflower is a really ancient and very powerful diaphoretic and um, and circulatory stimulant. And it has a, an affinity to the lungs. And I, what I love about the plant too, is that in the doctrine of signatures, which is the idea that the way plants look and they're shaped and they're even colored can tell you something about its medicinal virtues is that elder, uh, the flowers, if you, they look almost like a pair of lungs. So they have this sort of flat umbiliferate type of um, configuration. And so there's just tiny, tiny little flowers in one head. You could think about kind of like a Queen Anne's lace sort of look. That's the umbiliferate shape or like a fennel flower, all in the APACA family, um, even though elders not. But it has that same, that same shape and it looks like those little tiny avioli or lung sacs that, um, that it's a signature for. So it has an affinity to open the lungs, to increase the breath, and then also to open and open the periphery for sweating. Uh, if you don't have access to elderflower, then other things you can use are peppermint. A lot of people have peppermint teas in their you know, celestial seasonings. Really anything that's gonna that that's in the mint family will be helpful. Catnip, um, even things like hyssop. And yarrow is another one that's a wonderful diaphoretic. And yarrow grows wild throughout the country. I, I think mostly kind of in the Midwest and the East Coast, but that's another really great one. And it's all the aerial parts. Um, so, so that's another wonderful uh, lung tonic and circulatory stimulant and diaphoretic. Um, and yeah, I think those are the those are the main ones that I would think about for now. And then also sweating. You know, if you have a sauna, uh, well, maybe not at your gym. <laughs> if you can take a hot bath or you know steam up a room, that's another great way to get your pores and get everything moving. And so, you know, because I think what I was trying to get at, I wasn't articulating it very well, is that it's it's almost like we want to redeem Jupiter from this cold, dry condition where this thing is spreading where this thing is growing that's not really the right kind of jupiter that we want and so to meet that we're we're taking these kinds of plant medicines specifically to almost bring back the positive form of jupiter which is the openness the expansiveness the the, the fluidity so tell could you say something about what what these plants are doing that you just mentioned that helps to counter the effects of the coronavirus and also maybe the fear restrictiveness around that coronavirus right now. Yeah. So again, all of these plants are, they're going to warm the core. So they're going to really heat up. Another great example is ginger and everyone probably has experienced, you know, a, a nice ginger infusion. So, you know, we're, we're basically warming the interior and then that is creating sort of a little bit of like a, you know, you could think about kind of a restrictive heat and then that, gets pumped through the circulatory system to all of the little tiny capillaries throughout the body. And that creates circulation, uh, movement of heat, and then sweating and a heat response. So, you know, when we think about this, yeah, kind of on a more me metaphorical level, um, you know, we're kind of cooking and Paracelsus, who was a uh, he was coined the, the father of chemistry and the father, really, he was an alchemist. Um, and, you know, he talked about the stomach and the, the stomach as being the little alchemist in each of our bodies. And so we kind of have this opportunity to heat the core and start this sort of alchemic process of refining. Alchemy is really sort of refining things and 
um, breaking things down to their essentials. And then once we have that from the, the core, then we're moving that outward in an outward direction. And how does that how does that specifically address or meet the virus or the fear of the virus? How is that a counteraction to what the virus is doing or or what the fear of the virus is doing? So specifically for the virus, you know, the virus enters mostly through the nasal passages and the eyes and the mouth, the mucous membranes. And it does, like most viruses, it likes to live in an environment that is a little bit cooler than the core of the body. So we usually see like something like 97.6, um, 98.6 is the, the normal body temperature, but most viruses like something that's a little bit cooler. So if the body is a little bit cooler, this virus, like many others, will proliferate more quickly. And so if it's if dry, have, if it's well, if it's dry, it sticks there, right? So and it's the coolness it's cold, and the yeah. It's both of those that make the environment more susceptible. So heat and moisture is the antithesis of the environment. So you know, in some ways, like if you were living in a tropical rainforest and you weren't indoors, you're you would have a better chance of getting a more mild case of this, or or maybe not even not even having an environment for which it can replicate. Mm -hmm. And that's what we mean when we say that we're trying to, the medicine <clears throat> is trying to uh, act as a kind of counterbalance for or bring up the positive natural qualities of Jupiter from the debilitation in which Jupiter is in right now. Is that, does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And I think we're also, um, you know, with Jupiter, we're also in, in some ways, it, it, at least in old medicine, there was this, this idea of like cures like. Um, this is what homeopathy is based on. So if you take a little bit of something that has a similar quality to the disease that you're trying to fight, it will mount an immune response and then your body will be sort of better, more trained and more quickly able to respond to that. And so in some ways, a little dose of Jupiter right now is also going to help us um, you know, initiate that immune response so that our body is more able to deal with whatever it is that comes your way. I see. That's interesting. Um, so a few other things. Now, I want to know the, like, so first of all, in some ways, these different plant medicines that you mentioned, we'll have you repeat them again at the end for everyone, but they are things that could be used in order to keep yourself more open and a little bit just the environment we're not just talking about dealing with um where it's prevention but it's also something that you could be doing when if you actually contracted the coronavirus if i understand you correctly and it's also something that just in general on a psycho spiritual level can be addressing the mental emotional environment in which the virus is prone to spread is that so it can, it can cover all of those bases is that right yeah Absolutely. And I think that, you know, the, the idea too, it, it, I was just thinking about too, that we didn't really experience a winter, you know, the, the whole earth is, you know. We're here in the United States. There's some people watching who are going to be from all over, but. Okay. So right now we're in winter here in the United States. Um, but, you know, we didn't really have a winter. And so that the, the, the alchemy of winter, which is that inward turning, distilling, refining, becoming small, um, you know, we kind of skipped over that in some ways. And so I kind of feel like what a lot of the planets are trying to tell us right now is you can't do that. <laughs> There's yeah. no shortcut. Um, we all need that wintering time. Um, you know, maybe not if you're in a place that's, that's where it's summer, we all need that winter season of life and, and, and cyclically to come back to you know, letting go, reducing, eliminating certain patterns. Um, and, and, then, and then things can turn into that more dynamic, expansive energy. So I also, that, that kind of, I think, plays into the pattern that we're seeing too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we had to pause there for a second because uh, my wife had uh, a visit, a stink bug visitor crawl up her shirt. <laughs> I like the so, conversation it, it was like <laughs> yeah yeah totally she's we have an attic in our house and uh the attic we've turned into an office but we also get uh little visitors up there so <laughs> <laughs> anyway um okay so the next thing that i wanted to talk about is the difference between these particular kinds of plant medicines that we've been talking about what is the general word that you gave for them diaphoretic diaphoretic 
and um, other types of herbs or plant medicines that could be used right now in general as say immune boosters or anything else that you would recommend. And also if you could tell us what the difference is between say an immune booster and the diaphoretic and what do they work together? Should you only take one? And, and what are they doing differently for us um, when we're dealing with things like this, both psychologically and potentially physically? Sure. So, so yeah, so I mean, the diaphoretics, they kind of activate the body. We can think about them as <clears throat> sort of warming and waking things up. But we should use that, I would say, in conjunction with things that are immune modulators. And immune, immune modulators are a class of herbs that help your body better respond um, to immune situations, whether they're allergies or things like a virus. Um, and, you know, I, I think of them as sort of like training the immune system, like kind of, you know, you know, early, sp you know, spring training, like for athletes, it's like, it kind of does that within your, your immune system. And um, herbs that are, again, the way that I think about herbs as being most effective is we think we try, we want to always think about, well, where does the herb have an affinity in the body? So where are these herbs, um, where do they seem to have the most activity? So I mentioned elder has the, the affinity for the lungs as a diaphoretic. Well, reishi as an adaptogen, which helps the body modulate its stress responses and as an immune modulator, um, has an affinity to the lungs. So it's a lung protector. So this is the one that I'm, again, mentioning to my students and, and clients that this is a good one to start taking if you haven't started taking it. And it's a really beautiful medicinal mushroom. One of its more uh, traditional uses in, in Chinese medicine is to build shen, which is the brightness and the sparkle in the eyes. And if that's not a Jupiter type of <laughs> image, um, you know, it's the, it's the light from the heart that shines up and out through the eyes. Mm -hmm. And so reishi is a particular tonic for that. If, and it's, so it's an, also a mood lifter and an antidepressant. Mm. So that one has so many different qualities to it that, um, that are relevant to this particular virus. And also it's interesting that it is a mushroom and that it feeds on dead material. So there's something also about that alchemy and that transformation that reishi does to grow its own fruiting body and then the energy it has for us. Yeah, that certainly matches with the Jupiter-Pluto vibe right now as and, and the idea also sort of like treats, treats like, like um, something that grows in the shade or the darkness that also has the signature of being really abundant in light and um, providing immune support and stuff like that. But what are some others that people can, can take? Astragalus is another really nice one. That's a root. So um, it can be, you know, added to soups and stews. It's a really easy one, sweet. Kids take it. Um, you know, my, my girls are taking um, astragalus right now. Um, they love it too. I mean, don't, they, do. they, they love it. So if they have, they, they make, if you get them at the co-op or wherever you can, you can shop online and stuff like that. They have them for kids. Maybe you can mention some of the brands that we use and stuff like that, but they're for the, the kids, they, they make it so that it's not, you know, doesn't, doesn't taste like you're eating, you know, twigs. It's, it's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you can get, um, you know, yeah, kids forms of, of a lot of these different herbs. Um, other mushrooms are also in, you know, considered to be really good to take right now for the same reason. So cordyceps, um, maitake, and a nice one, if you don't have access to medicinal mushrooms that you can pick up at the supermarket is shiitake mushrooms. Mm -hmm. So shiitake mushrooms um, can just be cooked into your food. And that's another way to get that immune modulating and um, stress regulating response um, that can be helpful right now during this mm -hmm. time. Elderberry? Elderberry is a great one. So elderberry is, is a, it's a different medicine. It's not diaphoretic like elderflower. However, it does have a, a number of positive qualities, including and it's high in flavonoids, antioxidants, um, vitamin C. So it's a really nice preventative and you can take it during the flu as well. Um, so that's, the, you know, elderberry has been shown to help with uh, decreasing the amount of time that a person is sick with a cold or flu. Uh, vitamin C and zinc are also really good supplements. So uh, it's recommended to, you know, be taking at least 10 micrograms of zinc every day. Um, so that's something that, you know, people can do. And for kids, they have them in drop form. Mm -hmm. And um, another interesting thing that uh, is being called for right now in the traditional Chinese medicine field, which 
I'm paying particular attention to because this, this virus and the outbreak developed out of China. So in, in thinking back to that environment question is, you know, well, if, if it broke out and it sort of was birthed in China, like what, what plants are available in China? Like what, and what does the local and the traditional medical system of the Chinese people, what might it have to, to teach us and, and also Which is share? a really rich history of traditional Chinese medicine. And it's, it's actually, there, there are a lot of traditional Chinese um, medical practitioners who are suggesting things and it's a it's a little bit my you know my one of my best friends lives in china and it's a little bit more common for people to see and resort to traditional chinese medicine in in china in addition to western medicine here it's a bit more like oh i like to do alternative things and sometimes there's even a more hard polarization here between like traditional and and um sort of traditional or sort of like western allopathic medicine and like alternatives and from what my understanding is that in China, the two sometimes work together a little bit more closely than they do. There's a little bit more mutual respect. Um, and so traditional Chinese um, practi medicine practitioners are having, there's a lot that they're saying right now about the virus. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. There's a number of papers coming out of the, the Wuhan area um, of, you know, people on the ground in the hospitals working alongside doctors using Chinese medicine and acupuncture and having good results. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, really what I've been focusing on is what is the, the pattern of pathology that they're, like, how are they describing this disease? And one of the interesting things is that the first symptoms are actually a dry cough. So there's that Saturn image is that, you know, usually the first, that's usually the, what people feel first is they get a, a little bit of a, of, a, of, a, of a dry cough and then it turns into the second phase, which is the more active infection where we get that moisture and the cloying mucus and, you know, where it starts to settle in the lungs. Um, so, so yeah, so the, the traditional system is definitely looking at, uh, you know, using the traditional TCM language to describe these patterns, which is above my, <laughs> you know, knowledge of reading some of these papers, I'm like, whoa, it's like a whole, a whole different herbal language. Um, however, some of the herbs that they're using that are effective, um, I've been interested in a lot of herbalists here in the United States are interested in, well, what are some equivalents? What are some herbs that are the native version of those Chinese plants? Mm. Yeah. Um, so that we can be using local plants and, and maybe because our systems are also, you know, we live in this local environment. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that, that say that, you know, the medicine, the, the medicines that most of us need are in our own backyard for the ailments right. that we have. And so that's something that I've been trying to look at as well. Yeah. I mean, uh, for those of you who don't know this, uh, maybe about four or five years ago, I've been doing, I do a Kickstarter every year to support the production of all my content year round. And about five years ago, four years ago, part of what we raised the money for was to build a community herbal medicine garden. So we have about an acre and we have a really big herbal medicine garden in our backyard that Ashley teaches out of and people in the community come and pick free herbs from and Ashley shows them how to home make their medicines and stuff like that. So, um, you know, but the interesting thing was that when we first moved uh, to this little uh, plot, uh, um, and got our got, came into this house, you know, Ashley was out in the yard being like, oh my gosh, look at all the medicine. Like wherever we go, my wife is always medicine hunting. So she, you know, there's just like, she knows she can just, and she takes people on herb walks and plant walks and stuff like that. And I remember earlier this summer, just to tell a quick story, we were at an event and my daughter uh, banged her head on, on something and got a nice gash, like right on the center of her forehead. And my wife just took her for a walk to kind of calm her down because we were in a group setting and she went out took her for a walk and I came you know she came back and she had looked like mud all over her forehead and I was like what's that and she's like oh you know I just went to the bushes and got some of I remember I think it was yarrow or something and it just like slapped some yarrow on her and like I, I'm not kidding you I think it was yarrow but whatever it was <laughs> yeah it, it, it took down, you know it took down her swelling and everything like she should have had a lump on her forehead and it was gone like very very quickly anyway that's the benefit of learning herbal medicine really alongside of astrology the two together are, are still really really phenomenal because if you know the medicines in your backyard you know a little bit about what's going on with the planets and so forth it's like it becomes easy to a little bit easier anyway to to tune into you know 
the energetic signatures that you're dealing with in your body or in the environment. And then there's, there's doctrine of signatures. There are, there are matches right in our backyards. And that's the way it is for most of us actually, that unless you live like in a concrete jungle, right. But a lot of us who have even just a little bit of nature around us have a ton of medicine, like right, right in our backyard. Mm -hmm. That inspired speech, by the way, comes to you um, through my wife. That's me just channeling my wife over the past <laughs> 10 years. So <laughs> you've given me all that. So anyway, um, so the, the, what I wanted you to kind of tell us before we start closing down is um, what is immune, like when we're boosting our immune system, what are we doing? basically that um i mean wh what is it, what's happening in the body and how can we think of what's happening in energetic terms or you know give us some good metaphors to think about why boosting immunity is important because the people hear that and they just think that there's some uh, objective thing that's happening on a chemical level but what, make it a little bit more, more imaginatively vivid for us why are why are we taking immune boosters yeah. So I, I would think about it as, you know, the immune system is basically trying to sort out what is us and what is not us. You know, what is, what is my stuff, my tissues, my cells, and what is foreign? And so when we're working with the immune system, what we're trying to do is educate it and give it um, an environment. It's like, you know, think about foot soldiers in the desert versus foot soldiers in like a um, a water rich prairie with a lot of plants and trees like those soldiers are going to have a very different experience in those two environments so when we're when we're using immune boosting herbs we're doing a few things we're trying to give the immune system you know a, a good environment where it has all the resources it needs so that's food and diet you know that's all the that's nutrition and sleep and hydration, right? That's like, that's part of what we need to make the environment good. And then we can use the plants to help, you know, give the, give the army their, um, give them tools, give them maps, um, you know, give them push-up exercises and get them physically prepared for whatever comes. And, um, you know, I, I think on a more, on a more subtle level, you know, what I think is starting to happen is that there's a lot of autoimmunity in our culture too, where the immune system starts to fight itself. Mm -hmm. And that makes people very weak to these, um, these sorts of viruses that, mm -hmm. that come and go. So that's one thing to think about is, you know, how, how are we engaging with ourselves and what kind of work are we doing internally to, to figure out, well, what's mine and what's not mine? Like what's, mm -hmm. what's the media saying? What are the billboards trying to get me to think and feel about myself? And what's really authentically the joy and the truth that I feel from within and being able to create distinctions between those. I think that's one way to think about it too. That's great. You know, and the thing that comes to my mind is that there was, there was I, an op-ed I read somewhere or something I was reading on online. I think it was, I don't remember now, but it was, it was picking up on the fact that our, the president had described this disease or this um, virus as a foreign virus. And um, <clears throat> you had just used the word foreign. So it was picking, picking up on this. And but there's this there's this very subtle level of interplay with that concept, right? In some ways, again, it goes back to the quarantined, restrictive, you know, build the wall, whatever the the case might be. And I I really what I'm hearing you say is that in building immunity, what we're doing is we're we're readying our body on, and our our sort of personal ecology, psychically, spiritually, physically, to understand what's authentic to us. And what what somehow doesn't resonate or what isn't authentic to us, and that actually what we want from our immunity is when something comes in that is hostile or that you know is somehow invasive or intrusive, to be able to be uh, ready for it. But that immunity is absolutely not making us rigid, rigidly defensive, as in nothing gets in. It's more like oh, you've come in and I recognize what you are right away because I'm healthy and prepared to recognize what's working and what, what's going to work and what's not going to work, what's healthy, what's disease. Um, and it's, um, I just thought it was really, really interesting because one of the things we're seeing right now, whether you like the president or not, we know that he's really afraid of germs. 
Um, we know that he, it, it originally he tried to really downplay and almost like tried to gaslight <laughs> the coronavirus, you know, and to make, make people think that it like didn't exist. And then he described it as foreign, right? And, and he, there's this, you know, and of course he has a more isolationist philosophy in general. And I think that, you know, regardless of if you like him or not, I think that part of that mentality is actually conducive to the spread of the virus, which is to say that if you're overly rigid and protected and you're like, nothing gets in, that that's actually not immunity. That's actually not what a healthy immune system looks like. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. A healthy immune system is open and it says, okay, I see you. And then let's have a conversation. And there's a really, really great book called Plant Intelligence and the Imaginal Realm by herbalist and earth poet and activist, Stephen Buhner. And I highly recommend this book to, to anyone that's interested in plant medicine and the psyche, because in this book, he talks about viruses and bacteria. And he's, he, he kind of flips the way that we view it on its head and he kind of anthropomorphizes them to say, they're just communities looking for a better life. <laughs> you know, they're, they're intelligent and the way he describes the, the, the super highways and the ways that they build these structures and they build food banks. I mean, they're, they're so intelligent. And so the idea is not to rage against them or to be afraid of them, but rather to say, I see you, I acknowledge you, you can be there, but not here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, um, that is such a, that is a, again, precisely the, the difficulty of figuring out how to assume that position while being protective. For example, um, you know, we have the extreme of people who say, you know, the, the disease is, uh, you know, I was talking about this yesterday in a post and kind of having this discussion with a number of people, actually people, some people are saying, you know, the disease is the, the disease is fear. That's it. There's, you know, it's like almost, well, yeah, but there's also the, the germ, you know, there's also <laughs> the virus and it's a living being that's looking for a place to hang out. And, um, you know, it can come in and, and if the, if the environment of the body on a number of different levels, not just fear, but lots of different lifestyle habits and practices and demographics and age groups or whatever are going to be more conducive to it staying and hanging out than it will. And so, um, you know, uh, the, there is a sense in which the environment, um, you know, the thing that's really in our power is to make the environment really healthy and aware of what's going to be helpful for us and what isn't. Um, but it's important that we, we kind of hold the tension between this virus, thinking of it almost like a, yeah, like a, a, gr a group of people, like a group of beings, because they are alive, you know, and they're looking for a place to hang out and looking at my ecosystem and being like, and this is a place that they might want to hang out and thinking about it more in terms of, of a conversation. It's a real thing, but the environment of my body is maybe one of the biggest factors that I have control over that can determine whether or not this thing comes in or not. So anyway, um, so I think we're going to, we're going to end there. Um, this has been really fun. Let's recap on the diet diaphoretics. Do I say that right? Yep. And, and the immune boosters and where people can get them or, or where they, you know, what you would recommend and just a recap on what they do and why they're helpful. Sure. So the, the strategy for prevention would be to use a combination of diaphoretic herbs that warm the interior, immune modulators, which ready the immune system, and then adaptogens, which help your body respond to stress. So the diaphoretic herbs would be things that are warming and heating. So peppermint and ginger are really easy ones to find. Even like a chai tea recipe with cloves and cardamom. You know, you can take anything you have any warm, hot spices, oregano is another diaphoretic that a lot of us have in our kitchen cabinets. So, you know, making a tea of that every day, just maybe a few teaspoons full per cup. Um, and other, other ones that you can use are elderflower and uh, yarrow is a great one. Those are both probably about, you know, two teaspoons, maybe one teaspoon for yarrow, two teaspoons for the elderflower um, per cup of tea. Um, and then zinc and vitamin C are other 
or other um, just sort of general preventative immune boosters. And then we have our immunomodulators. And the top one on my list is reishi right now. And reishi is a tricky one because it has to be processed with heat before a lot of the polysaccharides become bioavailable and able to be used by the body. So I'm not affiliated with any supplement company. However, there are a few that I think are good quality and that's uh, host defense, and this is created by herbalist um, Paul Stamets, and then also um, Mushroom Harvest. Um, both of those companies carry reishi and all the other mushrooms that I mentioned, um, shiitake, cordyceps, um, turkey tail, uh, maitake, those are all different immune modulating herbs. Astragalus is a great immune modulating herb that you can take regularly as a glycerate, which is a sweet non-alcoholic form that's great for kids. Um, there's a company called Herbs for Kids that makes a glycerate that's really nice. Um, Echinacea is not a bad one. You could add that in along with elderberry um, in terms of immune, immune tonics. Um, and then we have, um, you know, Matthew Wood also recommends that we look at the liver and clearing any damp heat, which is part of the way that this virus um, stagnates in the body. So um, in China right now, they're using a lot of dandelion root. So you could make a, you know, cooked dandelion or burdock root would be a, a native uh, root as well. Um, both of them grow here and dandelion is also native to China. So we could do dandelion and, bur and burdock as a decoction for the liver. Um, and then for the, um, for the adaptogens, which helps to modulate stress response, which has an impact on the immune system. Reishi is an overlap and astragalus is an overlap. So you could do those and cover, you know, feed two birds with one hand, as I like to say. Um, but you could also do things like echinacea um, and um, actually, sorry, no, echinacea is an uh, immune modulator. So other adaptogens would be things like um, your, uh, you could do a luthro or, um, some of the ginsengs, be careful how they're, if they're, you know, ethically harvested or not. Um, but you, you know, there's a lot of adaptogens out there on the market. Um, ashwagandha is another one that you could do. So those would be the preventatives that, that you can do along with hand washing and eating well. Then in terms of the actual virus, things that you might want to have on hand, should you get ill and should you not be able to get medical attention um, or if you want to do herbs and a more medical approach, once it settles in the lungs and there's difficulty breathing, difficulty expectorating or getting the mucus out, herbs like OSHA, OSHA was used during the 1918 plague very effectively and um, has been used in Native American medicine. So that is one. Um, Lomatium is on the endangered list. So that one is like used sparingly. Angelica is another great one to clear that damp heat. And you could use Angelica Archangelica or the Chinese Angelica Sinensis or Dong Quai. Um, anything with berberine in it. So if it has that bright yellow color like Oregon grape root, bayberry, um, golden seals endangered. So, you know, sparingly you could use that if it's ethically, um, ethically grown um, and, and uh, you know, grown in farms, I would say is really the best way to use golden seal at this point because of its endangered status. And then other herbs that grow prolifically that you could use for that, um, for that late stage would be mugwort is like a weed. It grows pretty much everywhere here on the East Coast. And if you need it, you know, get in touch with um, Achuta and I can, I can mail you some. Um, <laughs> Also, um, ground ivy, which is glaucoma heteraceae, and this is a low creeping herb that is, uh, it, it, it just, it's everywhere, and it's already up in my gardens here in Maryland, and glaucoma heteraceae is a very strong antiviral. It clears the lungs, it clears excess heat from the kidneys, um, and it's also a diaphoretic. So it has all of those in one. So those are just a few. There's a yes. lot of great protocols out there. Just so a few. <laughs> I know. Sorry. I, it's hard to limit them. <laughs> no, I mean you're you're an, you're encyclopedic when it comes to um, when it comes to plants. It was one of the one of the very first things that I found um, super attractive about you. In fact, was you were just a walking encyclopedia of knowledge. <laughs> so anyway, I couldn't recommend. Um, also, if you're wanting to have a session ever with my wife, um, you can go to skyhouseyoga.com still to book for, she's in the process of building a new website, but skyhouseyoga.com and you can check out her herbal apprenticeship programs that she teaches online year round. 
as well as her um, uh, sessions, which she can do uh, over Skype. And um, that's right, skyhouseyoga.com still. Yeah, skyhouseyoga.com. And um, when the new website is skyhouseherbs.com, and that one actually has a contact form. So that one's live now. If you just want to reach out to me to schedule, that's a really easy way to get mm -hmm. right to me. Yeah. Um, the part of our goal for this year is going to be to produce, start producing more uh, herbal and astrological content, maybe a, a couple times a month even. And some of that's going to be available exclusively through my newsletter for subscribers uh, along with bhakti yoga content so if you haven't checked out my new website nightlightastrology.com sign up for the newsletter you'll occasionally get uh, little talks from my wife and i about what's going on and what herbs to take and other fun things um, about planets and plants um, that i won't be publishing anywhere else so that's kind of a fun incentive to uh, check out my newsletter um, there's one more thing I, I know I wanted to close down right now, but I'm just remembering one thing that I really wanted to talk about. Just, I want to get your, your thoughts just briefly. This affects the lungs. And in, I think it, we were saying in traditional Chinese medicine, we were talking last night that, that that's really interesting because of the, uh, what the lungs are associated with when, when they're thought to be afflicted. Could you just mention that again? Cause that's actually super interesting because this is yeah. a respiratory illness that affects the lungs, right? So what do the lungs tell us? Right. So in traditional Chinese medicine, there are correspondences of different emotions in different organ systems. And so the lungs or are, are um, they are, they correlate with, uh, with grief. So mm -hmm. when we feel grief, um, that is an, that is the emotion of the lungs. And if you, you know, if you have ever experienced, you know, gotten really bad news and lost someone it is it's like it takes the breath right out of you mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so yeah we were talking about that last night and, and it's just interesting to think like well what are we grieving mm -hmm. you know what is this grief about you know is what is it maybe that we're not acknowledging that has weakened us as a as a society yeah and uh you know in in um interestingly enough in ancient western astrology the lungs are ruled by cancer and cancer is, of course, the polar opposite sign of Capricorn. And anytime there's a lineup in one sign, the potential for there to be um, almost like a secretive um, oppositional tension with the other sign, even if there aren't planets there, is always a possibility because the language of astrology's uh, ancient astrology works across polarities of all kinds, sun, moon, um, the polarity of the four qualities, hot versus cold, damp versus dry. Um, detriment versus rulership, exaltation versus fall, daytime versus nighttime, fortune versus spirit, uh, primary motion versus secondary motion. And so cancer also, it's just so interesting that cancer is a sign that has so much to do with processing of emotions and that it also rules the lungs. And um, so when we were talking about this last night, I just thought it's so interesting to also think that everything that's going on right now, one of the, maybe one of the healthiest things we could do if we are you know, if we if we're separated out a little bit, we we have to take a break from business as usual in the world. Boy, is it a great time to um, internally try to look and look at what unprocessed emotions or grief that we're holding. And so we were talking about this last night that we just had to make sure we mentioned this, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's really, really powerful. So, um, you know, and again, those diaphoretics and something like elder is going to be something that's going to help open that up even more. Um, yeah, in, in, in a, both a physical and an energetic way. Yeah, right on. Well, um, from me, a Cancer, and my wife, a Taurus, we, uh, uh, we certainly hope that this video has been uh, warming and, um, and that it's been um, supportive and that you have enjoyed the, especially enjoyed the knowledge of my, my wife and her, everything that she has to say about plants and that the crossover between planets and plants is something that um, you'll continue to enjoy as we build more content for you throughout the year. So um, thank you so much for watching. Uh, leave your comments in the comments section. Tell us what herbs you're working with. Tell us uh, what you're doing for immune, your immune system. Um, you know, people, all of us are really a community storehouse of knowledge about this kind of stuff. So please share your own expertise and your own knowledge and uh, your own stories about what you're doing to take care of yourself. We'd love to hear from you guys. Okay. Take it easy, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.